Hello and welcome to module 31. I am Professor Ashmi Raman and in this module titled Transitional Justice, Some Regional Issues, we will cover some of the residual issues from the previous module. The learning outcomes in this module are for you to understand the similarities and the differences between transitional justice processes in three states that we have selected in South Asia. In this module, the topics that we will discuss will be a brief overview of the conflict in, Sierra Le in Sri Lanka, the transitional justice approaches taken by Sri Lanka. We will also discuss Myanmar's transitional justice, including addressing a country's past in a time of change. Let us start with a short background understanding, uh, including an effective transitional justice for Myanmar, as well as Nepal's proposed ordinance on the Commission on Disappeared Persons and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that is sought to be created under the Nepalese current government. Through these three examples, Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Nepal, I hope to show you the regional issues that are indicted by transitional justice. As I've told you, this module covers three carefully selected case studies from Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Nepal. Each of them will provide you a brief backdrop on the conflict in that state and then a discussion on the transitional justice mechanisms employed or proposed to be employed by that state. While some features of the reconciliation or truth-seeking efforts of these states overlap in theory, they nonetheless make for distinct case studies to be analyzed contextually by situating them in the socio-political and economic realities that characterize each of these three conflicts over the last 40 years. Let us begin by trying to get an overview of the conflict in Sri Lanka. The origins of the conflict in Sri Lanka are as contested as any other identity-based conflict. It is said that the Tamil struggle started in a post-independent Sri Lanka, while the civil war, which broke out as a result of the identity politics, began about 35 years ago. The reason behind the civil war was the question of who would constitute the majority of government institutions and in fact the governance structures in the states, the Sinhalese or the Tamils. The Tamils give reason for their part of the struggle as an attempt to take hold of government institutions as a demand for complete sovereignty over the northern and eastern provinces of Sri Lanka. The official language of Sri Lanka is Sinhala, since more than 70% of the country consists of Sinhalese people. This creates, of course, a game of numbers and causes a disadvantage to the minority of the Tamil-speaking population. Although amendments were made to include Tamil also as an official language, the fact still remains that the country is yet to formally constitutionalize and implement this kind of protection of minorities. Along with the many directives to change the language uh, policy of the country, both sides of this conflict, Sinhalese and Tamil, have involved themselves in physical violence against each other. For the Tamils, the war was waged by the military wing known as the LT. TE, who claimed to be fighting for self-determination because the government that was in control in the centre was not doing anything to help their minority cause. For the Sinhalese, the war has been waged by the military of the state, claiming a war of self-defence against a very dangerous terrorist outfit. Both the sides involved in this conflict subject themselves to human rights violations and to each other to human rights violations. 
In the case of the LTTE, this includes the assassination of political and civil leaders of the Sinhalese movement. Towards the last decade of the war, the Sri Lankan government violated the ceasefire agreement. And as a result of this, the LTTE went on a rampage. By the end of the second burst of violence, an approximate number of 300,000 civilians had been killed. And the Sri Lankan civil war went down as one of the most brutal wars in history. What approaches has Sri Lanka taken after the adoption of a new constitution and the coming into position of a new peaceful government? Sri Lanka has adopted truth-seeking approaches on four occasions. Once in 2001, where a presidentially nominated Truth Commission was established to investigate the violence that took place in 1981 and 1984. The result of this was the President of Sri Lanka at the time officially apologized for the ethnic violence that had taken place between 91 and 94. In 1994, three presidential inquiries were made into the enforced disappearances that took place in the state from the late 80s to the early 90s. In 2006, the President of Sri Lanka established an independent commission of inquiry whose task was to investigate the large-scale human rights violations that allegedly took place in the August of 2005. This independent commission was asked to look into 15 discrete acts of violence, one of them being the assassination of the former Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2005 and separately the internationally famous massacre of 17 aid workers that took place in 2006. The Commission, however, only had the power to look into a four-year time frame since the entire conflict was temporally framed and it was set up when the war effort in the country was being rebuilt. In addition to this, there was one more controversial step, that is the appointment of the IGEP, the International Independent Group of Eminent Persons, which looked into these incidents. The IGEP, however, prematurely withdrew its involvement without publishing a report of its findings. Apart from these distilled and discreet exercises of attempts to broker peace, there have been official and unofficial inquiries into the acts of violence in the course of the civil war, which have been variously documented by civil society groups as well as international and domestic, including regional human rights organizations. A specifically constituted disappearance inquiry was started by the Sri Lankan government, which was then taken over by an organization called the Families of the Disappeared. The acronym for this was the FTD. The FTD became an important part of the Sri Lankan struggle for peace. However, both of the inquiries were left unfinished, despite their ambitious beginnings and one third of the complaints brought before them have been undocumented and in fact uninvestigated at least as far as public records suggest. Added to this is the fact that legal action was brought out against an approximate uh, number of about 500 police and army personnel who were involved in the ethnic conflict. But these largely targeted low-level officials and very few of these proceedings actually resulted in the punishment or public indictment of those involved. The failure, therefore, of all these exercises at transitional justice have left the affected families in Sri Lanka with very little hope for ever finding closure and for ever reconciling with the other side. Two of the transitional justice truth-seeking exercises are still at work. One is the UN's panel of experts, 
This is a non-governmental initiative. It receives no support from the current Sri Lankan government. This panel's main job that it is responsible for advising the Secretary General of the United Nations about the general situation in the country. The extent to which this panel can work in Sri Lanka is also limited because they have to work around the obstacle of existing material as well as lack of public support, including governmental support. Since they cannot obtain any new material because they are external to the country and are not recognized by the country's laws, this creates a legitimacy deficit in the whole exercise itself. The second exercise is the LLRC. This is an initiative of the government of Sri Lanka to look into the CFA violation, a specific event that took place in 2002 and the events that led to the second outburst of violence in 2009. The LLRC shows that the Sri Lankan government is making an independent attempt to resort to mechanisms of transitional justice after the war, even though as all new governments have, it had the choice to not do so, not entertain this possibility and just close up the entire history for inquiry. But the LLRC has come up with interesting suggestions for immediate action. One of them being the setting up of a system to deal with those who are being held in detention indefinitely without reason. This is an important aspect of the Sri Lankan conflict uh, and draws attention to the specific aspects of the conflict such as the disappeared persons. International watchdogs like Amnesty International etc have declined their permission to appear before this LLRC giving reason to the commission's independence, uh, giving reason to, to question the independence of the commission along with the lack of um, investigative power that the commission has over war crimes that took place in the course of the conflict. To understand Sri Lanka as it has emerged as a sovereign state after the civil war, Sri Lanka is faced with a very sensitive situation of dealing with the mess that has been created by its history and how to curate that history while at the same time not alienating the people from the present government which after so many years finally has the support of the people. The current situation as you can imagine is not an easy one to deal with and in fact the fact remains that even starting to deal with the past might end up backfiring. But the country has to deal with its past, failing which the unfinished business of the war might end up creating another war. In my opinion, the time has come for Sri Lanka to start its journey towards peace in a meaningful manner. And by saying this, I mean that this can only be done through the route of transitional justice. Myanmar's transitional justice journey, addressing a country's past in a time of change. As you know, Myanmar is located in Southeast Asia and has a population of about 55 million people. Historically speaking, it was one of the richest states in the region, which lost all of its peace, security and economic stability after the end of the Second World War. Myanmar has been subject to authoritative rule for about two centuries. The 19th century saw the occupation of the state by the British, similar to the colonial experiment in neighboring countries, including India, followed by the first half of the 20th century, during which India gained independence, but Myanmar saw the occupation by the Japanese. Country obtained its independence from the Japanese in 1948, only to be taken over again by General Nguyen in 1962, who overthrew the interim government that had barely been in power for two decades and created a military government headed by the Revolutionary Council. In this context, after 1962 and the overtake by the Revolutionary Council, the new government strongly supported China's ideas of socialism and placed a self-imposed isolation on Myanmar from other states. In 1987, Myanmar was declared a least developed country by the United Nations ranking of development indicia in countries. This categorization was caused in part 
by the extreme slowing down and the crippling effect of colonialism on the economic growth and prosperity of Myanmar. As a result of low economic opportunities, in the August of 1988, students in Myanmar held a protest and the government responded by killing thousands of citizens. The government then reorganized the state into a law and order, state law and order restoration council, the SLORC, and declared the imposition of martial law under Myanmar's constitution. In 1990, the National League of Democracy, NLD, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, won the elections, but the government refused to transfer the powers. The military changed its name from the SLORC and called itself the State Peace and Development Council, the SPDC, in 1997. Suu Kyi was placed under house arrest, along with many others who protested the military government. This house arrest of a popular Western liberal activist, Suu Kyi, attracted attention from Western governments and led to them campaigning against the imposition of military rule in Myanmar. And the allegations that Myanmar faced not only a democratic deficit, but also did not comport with the rule of law. Myanmar was faced with problems well into the 21st century. When in 2007, a protest by, a peaceful protest by the Buddhist monks of Myanmar called the Saffron Revolution, resulted in yet another violent showcase by the government who responded to peace with violence. In 2010, the Myanmarese government once again underwent elections. Except that this was another way for the government to intimidate and force the population into voting for militarily run parties, the so-called junta. The military or the Myanmarese junta continued to destroy ethnic groups by torturing, raping and killing its own population. After the elections, the military and the democratic Karen Buddhist army kept up the fighting on an irregular basis along the Myanmar-Thailand border. Myanmar saw a significant change in politics only as late as 2011, when the civilian government led by Tian Sen took over the military-led junta on the 30th of March 2011. This change saw the long-awaited release of Aung San Suu Kyi and saw her taking her place in parliament along with the National League of Democracy winning the elections in Myanmar. In the August of 2012, Myanmar banned the censor on private publications and in September, Tian Sen spoke in front of the United Nations, assuring everybody that Myanmar's change for the better will not be undone by the country's policies. The state has experienced an extraordinary isolation from the outer world, secluded and sequestered among the bustling states of Southeast Asia for almost four decades. Because of the seclusion and silence, the military's atrocities went largely unnoticed and unanswered for until the Western governments started criticizing and creating a rhetoric that spoke of the military regime abusing Myanmar's people and violating their human rights. The United States led the battle of the liberals and protested against the Myanmar's government's attempt to introduce the Customs and Trade Act that enabled the US to impose economic sanctions against Myanmar if Myanmar does not show any improvement regarding its human rights situation. This is how soft law works in international law through the imposition of sanctions by powerful states against weaker ones if they fail to comply with international standards. The European Union also imposed some sanctions on high-ranking military officials and families of the juntas 
by freezing their assets and denying them visas and the right to travel. All of this was completely reversed when in 2012, everybody thought Myanmar had undergone a new change. Tian Sen took over with the blessings of the Western governments, especially the United States, which eased its sanction on investments in Myanmar. The European Union also lifted its bans on asset freezing and the sanctions on visas for 12 months, allowing EU countries not only to invest in Myanmar, but also for Myanmarese people to enjoy the benefits of these investments by giving them, for the first time in four decades, access to the outside world. Having broken the silence of the last four decades, Myanmar had to move quickly towards an effective transitional justice system. There is a need now for the Western governments not only to concentrate on the economic liberalization of Myanmar, because it is a state that is incapable of doing this on its own, but also to assist Myanmar, which cannot do this independently, on bringing peace to the people of the state. Even today, most states are not trusting of Myanmar's actions. An example of the fact that Myanmar has not completely amended its ways is that it is fighting a war in the Kachin state against an ethnic minority. The soldiers fighting in Kachin are part of the junta and are the same people that were responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity during the large and largely uninterrupted rule of the previous junta. Even though the new government has promised democracy to the external world, the fact still remains that it continues to abuse and oppress the Rohingya Muslims in the state of Rakhini. And in order to help Myanmar face not only its past actions and reconcile with its population, but also to equip it to deal with future plans, the United Nations has come up with the idea to institute a commission of inquiry in order to bring out those most responsible for the violation of human rights. The calls for setting up this council have quietened down after seeing Myanmar's largely peaceful transition into a democratic state. But the aim of this commission, had it been instituted, would have been to look into human rights violations, something that has been done in the past in Yugoslavia and in Rwanda, as well as in Darfur and most importantly, South Africa through the apartheid uh, movement through the intervention of Bishop Desmond Tutu. Although at one point the United States did support the idea of a commission, it eventually fell apart due to a variety of reasons. Firstly, that the events took place in Myanmar were not of um, a magnitude that was covered sufficiently by the media. This is because of the silences in the country and the military-run government that had imposed a ban on publications and the opening up of Myanmarese news to the outside world. However, this silence was one that the government had to pay dearly for as it opposed the creation of documentation. Without documentation, it had become extremely hard to expose the truth of what transpired during those decades of silence in Myanmar. Secondly, both China and Russia, as permanent members of the Security Council, vetoed the United Nations Security Council resolution calling for the immediate release of Aung San Suu Kyi and harshly objecting to Myanmar's human rights abuses. The Chinese state's argument was that Myanmar's human rights violations were not a threat to international peace and security. And in fact, the creation of a conflict in Myanmar was an elevation of the rule of territorial sovereignty under the Charter. China had made it amply clear that it would strongly object to any coercive me measures taken by the United Nations to enforce a civilian army on Myanmar and to breach the rule of territorial integrity. By defending the principles of the Charter, China therefore stood as a barrier between the organization created by the Charter and a state party to the Charter. 
China has played an important role in mobilizing the economy of Myanmar. And the reason that Myanmar does not um, have to pay due heed to Western governments is in fact because it enjoys Chinese support. Finally, many of Myanmar's neighbors were against the setting up of a United Nations Commission. They did not show support and the support would have been crucial for the establishment of increasing pressure on the junta at the time. The final case study in this module is Nepal. I urge you to go through the written materials and study it yourself in order to understand how the Nepalese truth and reconciliation system is quite different from Sri Lankan and Myanmarese. I would also urge you to draw the conclusions required from this module in order to conduct your own self-study assessment included at the end of the module. Thank you.